Uh, so welcome to the Cider Press. Uh, this is our talk. Uh, we don't get to talk together too much, but we decided to do a talk this time. Uh, this is the Cider Press. We're going to extract forensic artifacts from Apple continuity. I'm Heather, or Arnold. Um, <laughs> Sarah's my twin. We like to compare ourselves to twins here, so we thought this would be interesting. Phil essentially introduced us. We're not going to spend too much time. So work for Sands, work for Mantech, smartphone nerd. I like bourbon, so wine, courses. <laughs> And I'm Sarah Edwards, uh, of course, uh, again, another author, instructor. I also have a day job. And it's weird, because we get to work together in our day jobs and our SANS lives, too. You can't pull us apart, therefore, we are the twins. And unfortunately, <laughs> I get Danny DeVito. I don't know who wins or loses on this one, to be honest <laughs> with you. So what is continuity? So continuity is across all Apple devices, whether it's your phone, your iPads, your Mac, uh, your watches. It's the seamless interaction between all of these devices to do fun stuff, uh, to help you do certain things. Uh, there are certain requirements. There's software, there's hardware requirements. It's on some of the newer devices, so if you have a really old phone or a really old Mac, it probably won't work. Uh, it's got these specific wireless and Bluetooth um, uh, hardware to actually get this functionality to work. Uh, there's a few other requirements as well. For most of the interaction, you need Wi-Fi and Bluetooth turned on, and you need handoff uh, to be selected as well. Uh, so we'll go through some of those things and the requirements for each particular piece of Apple continuity itself. What we did for our evidence, that's what you can see here. So we used my phone um, and Sarah's phone. Sarah's the jailbroken one. The artifacts that you're going to see today are from my actual device, so no, no jailbreak included. Um, we do have some caveats built in. We both had our Macs um, running two different versions, which don't really play all that much in differences here. Um, old watch, new watch, and then what you don't actually see at this point, and you will see in the future, is Phil was sitting behind the scenes and capturing network traffic going back and forth. Um, one thing that was difficult is Sarah and I chose something that you really need to be in proximity to create data sets on, and we don't live close to one another. So we are trying to do this from Philly and DC. So on some of our evidence here, you will see where we were talking to ourselves versus talking to one another. So we do commingle it, yeah. and you'll see this in the slides. Uh, so first, just as a little start off, I'm gonna be referencing a lot of different GUIDs and hardware pieces uh, within the slides. So where do you find these things on your own devices when you're doing a forensic analysis? Uh, I've got a couple of um, screenshots up here. Uh, these are my Bluetooth settings. So this is for my phone and for my watch. So it's called My Watch and My Phone 7, uh, just to kind of put that into uh, perspective for you. So you will see the GUIDs here, the F7s and the C9s, throughout a lot of the logs that I'm going to show you. We'll also see uh, a couple of different Bluetooth addresses as well. So these MAC addresses that are actually shown to you here, we don't actually get to see this in the logs too much. It's more or less referencing those GUIDs that I showed you on the previous slide. Uh, so when you're doing keyword searching, you might want to pull out those GUIDs first and then keyword search those logs that I'll show you about in just a little bit. And of course, on the iOS side of the house, you still got those UUIDs or those GUIDs that you can search on as well. So the plists are pretty much the same. This one just happens to be in the database because that's how iOS works. So how this all works together. There's a little thing called Bonjour, uh, and this is Apple's name for basically zero configuration networking. You find zero configuration networking on lots of other devices. Windows has their own. Uh, other mobile devices have their own as well. But Bonjour is a Mac-specific technology. But it's built upon pretty much industry standards. So just kind of a little skit that we have here for you. How it works in the most simplest form. Uh, and there's plenty of documentation out there to show you how it all works in more detailed form. But this is generally how it's going to go. So you get a device here saying, hey, I just turned on AirDrop, what can I do with it? So, hey y'all, I got AirDrop. I'm over here by myself. Um, I have no friends. Who can I AirDrop with? Oh, I can be your friend. Let's AirDrop. Excellent, I'm gonna drop it like it's hot. Yeah. So there's that discovery and the publication, the resolution of all those things. I mean, this is extremely simplified, but there is that kind of interaction. We'll see that in the logs as well. So with AirDrop, um, we have different scenarios here. We spent a bulk of our examination time in AirDrop. The log files are really overwhelming, and we redacted a lot, which you'll see. 
So we did different scenarios. You can see here some screenshots from Sarah's device, from my devices, um, from our computers. So what you will see, each of the headers going forward, you're going to see Mac to iPhone, iPhone to iPhone, iPhone to Mac. So just make sure you're reading the slide titles when you actually get copies of these files if you're trying to replicate what we did. Um, important for you to know is you can airdrop to anyone. So you'll see we broadcast to everyone, which is shown here. You'll see we were broadcasting yesterday in the restaurant downstairs. We could see other people's random devices. As long as you're in proximity, a peer-to-peer -peer connection will be established and you can drop files to one another. So you will see this in our slides. Yeah. So AirDrop, first off, is the technology that allows us to drop different files back and forth. So we're going to show you a few examples of those. So first thing I'd like to show you are different IDs and identifiers that you can search on uh, in your logs. So Mac and iOS pretty much has the same thing. Uh, for the Mac, we got two different plist files here. One's called sharing B, the other one's got sharing B in it as well. So if you're looking for continuity-based stuff, look for that term called sharing D. Uh, it's the sharing daemon associated with a lot of that sharing continuity interaction. Uh, and same thing on iOS. So for these two examples, I want to see what the discoverability mode is, whether it's sent to everyone or contacts only or if it's turned off altogether. But I also want to take a look at the airdrop ID. I'm going to reference that in the logs that we're going to see. So that's how you tie a certain device in the logs to other activity. So we have this scenario here. Uh, the screenshot here shows you that I'm on my Mac right now and I see two different devices. So these devices don't have any icons, they're just the gray bubble with the, the white head in there. One's called Dade Phone and the other is Heather Mahalik's phone. So I'm on my Mac right now and I can see both of these devices. So what does that look like? And this is just a discovery of the devices. There's absolutely no file transfer just yet. In the Mac Unified logs, now, Mac Unified Logs, our brand new logging system on, um, um, on all the newest Mac-based devices, so Sierra, iOS 10, and all sorts of good stuff like that. So these are the newer version of those logs. And I have a whole other presentation on how to read those Unified Logs that you can find on my website if you're interested. So this is just the discovery. So I opened up Finder and saw these two devices. What does that look like? So in the logs themselves, if I do searches for that sharing D term again, and more specifically, the com.apple.sharing.airdrop specifically. So it's going to show you the different categories of different continuity items in here as well. So just a few items that I have bolded here. You can see the server's been initialized, the finder entered airdrop, meaning I selected airdrop in my finder window. You see some Bluetooth scanning going on here, so it uses a uh, Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth LE scanning, so you see that all the time. So these logs are extremely verbose. There are hundreds, perhaps thousands of different log entries. So we've only cut it down to a few just to show you the different type of activity here. So we get some Bluetooth LE scanning starting, scanning mode. So this particular one's doing contents, uh, cont contacts only versus everyone. Um, you'll also see some MDNS responder. This is very much associated with the bonjour activity that we were talking about before. So you see a lot of these items in here. Um, one under, under below that, you see the AWDL. This is that peer-to-peer -peer communication. Uh, this is the Apple Wireless Direct Link. It's another interface on your Apple devices. It's not specific to EN0, it's not the EN1 interface, it's specific only to that direct link type of interface. So it's almost like an ad hoc or peer-to-peer kind of thing, and that's how all the continuity stuff works. And then finally, we see some other items in there with the airdrop terminology in there, Bonjour Discovery Started, Com Apple Sharing Browser. This means I'm actually browsing uh, for different um, people to communicate with. And then finally, at the bo bottom, we have the Com Apple Sharing D, no airdrop people discovered after eight seconds. So it's constantly looking for different people, and if you have airdrop open on your Macs right now, you can see people popping up back and forth. Now if I can continue on, there's more stuff. So this is now discovering these two devices that I have here. So I got Bonjour uh, discovered, and I have this number, this ED2A number. So I have a couple of these. This is their, that airdrop ID number that's associated with a specific device. So if you need to tie two things together, you're gonna need that airdrop, airdrop ID. 
Finally, we get some more Bonjour and MDNS Responder. And then we can also see associations to the name, the host name of the device. In this case, I'm seeing Dade phone in here. If I keep going a little bit further down, I'm discovering Heather Mahalik's phone. And then finally, in the bottom, we have Com Apple Sharing Browser. Now it sees those two devices that I showed you in that original screenshot, uh, uh, the Dade phone and Heather's iPhone, with both those Apple IDs associated with it. So then we did a transfer. Um, if anyone's not aware of this, this is the Mac on the left-hand side. This is actually a fire that happened in Rob's mom's hometown here that you can see, and it's terrifying. Um, the end, oddly, of the video gets gory. So when Sarah dropped this to me, instead of showing the beginning of the fire, we found it very strange that it showed the end, which is why it's blurred out. It's a little gory. So what you're seeing here is uh, several things. On the left-hand side, we see Sarah's Mac. She had it set to see everyone. So when we were sitting there sharing files, we saw other people who were around us that weren't even a part of this. We considered sending them the fire, but we didn't. Mm -hmm. um, on the right, you could see my iPhone. Because Sarah and I are not on the same iCloud account, it asks me, do I want to decline or accept? And I'll cover this further in my slides, but we're going to actually look at what this transfer looked like on the Mac, and then we'll cover it on the iPhone. So from the Mac itself, it says airdrop server enabled on port 8770. You'll see that port number used pretty often, so if you want to search by that, you can go ahead and do that. You can see TCP connections being started up. It does an SSL negotiation. And I have highlighted and underscored here the received verb. So the verbs are going to tell you which direction it's going into. So I'm going to point that out in a couple of different places. In this case, it's doing a received discovery request. It's receiving this. It's receiving a video from my phone 7. Uh, that my phone 7 and that informative text section there, that is actually on my Mac, that little pop-up notification window that comes up saying, would you like to accept this movie from Heather's iPhone? or from my iPhone, or from wherever it's coming from. The, uh, accept or decline, so they get that notification information. And finally, we get the received, uh, uh, the received upload request, adaptive compression, so it's moving all this data back and forth, not necessarily across the network, but potentially over Bluetooth as well. And then finally, the transaction end. So we see a server transaction begin and an end, so you know that that transaction actually happened. And finally, we can see the airdrop ID that's been associated with that. And there's that ED2A again there. A couple of items that get transferred. So it's not just about logs on the Mac. On the Mac, actually, airdrop stuff is much easier to look for. So if I receive certain files, movies, pictures, whatever it might be, there's some other artifacts that I can take a look at as well. So for this one, just in the simple downloads directory. It's one of the default locations. If somebody's gonna airdrop you something, you can accept it into your default downloads. So that's a first quick look of where that stuff might happen. So some of the timestamps actually get saved. So this uh, movie here was actually taken on June 15th while I received it on June 18th. So you get some preservation of timestamps here. Um, in the yellow highlighted, the permissions, sometimes, not always, you'll see that access BPF permission. Uh, the Berkeley packet filter kind of thing going on there. So you know it somehow got moved across the network somehow. But I'll tell you right now, it doesn't happen on all airdropped stuff. Uh, so just be aware of that. We also get extended attribute information. If you take my class, you know I love extended attributes. Love them to death. And we get some information associated with that, specifically two that I want to talk about. Uh, the K Com Apple metadata KMD item where froms and the Com Apple quarantine. KMD item where froms basically says, where did this thing come from? Now it's a binary plist, but you can see the strings in there that says Sarah's, uh, Sarah Edwards' iPhone, my phone 7 in there. Uh, now in the quarantine information, you'll see that it has that sharing D uh, process in there. And that hex value, that's actually the timestamp that it was airdropped onto the system. Now, if I happen to open up this movie in QuickTime Player, that quarantine attribute may change. So it's not always going to be the sharing D if potentially it was opened up in a different piece of software. So something to just be aware of. And of course, if it does get opened up, we can still go back to the quarantine database where all the original information is being stored uh, to get that original timestamp and that sharing D and the from and uh, from who, who did it come from information. In this case, 
it was airdropping to myself, so it has my name in there. So a lot of different pieces here that we can start to put together. Uh, so there's also this purgatory, as I like to call it. If somebody's sending me something um, and it's somebody I don't know, it kind of goes into this purgatory area, this cleanup at startup. So it's gonna store it in here temporarily until I view it or until I see it uh, kind of thing. It doesn't happen on all airdropped information, but it is, it, it is a good place to check. Uh, so take a look at that. And this does get cleaned up at startup. So once I reboot that system, that all gets flushed away. Something to be aware of. So one more thing. Uh, from Mac to phone, how do you know which file it actually sent? So it'll actually store that information in there too. And I have a couple of examples. If you just do a file colon slash slash search across all the logs, you'll see uh, different examples. Uh, the top one here is the catalog node ID for a particular file. But sometimes if I'm airdropping from within an application, if you look below that com uh, Apple sharing airdrop, starting to send files, uh, you'll see that in that var folders path, you'll see the com apple photos bundle ID in there too. So this is me using the photos application to airdrop those things out. So it kind of gives you a better idea of where those files are actually being stored on disk. All right, this is where I wanted some sound effects of wah wah. So just to warn you, if you strictly have a newer device, so we're using the iPhone 7 on my device, it's not jailbroken, so you're essentially stuck with a backup file. Um, the artifacts that I got, you're going to have to get really, really crafty, just to caution you here. So with the phone here, you can see I'm getting an airdrop from my husband's device. He's not on my same iCloud account. You get an option. Do you want to accept or decline? If you accept, and it's a photo or a video, it's going to the default DCIM directory, and we'll talk about what this looks like in a second. Um, if it's not, if it's a text file or a PDF or something else, you get an option on how you want to open it. The bad news is, if you decline, at this point, I have not been able to find any logs showing that it was even offered to me. So you can see why you would want to do this, but right now I haven't been able to. For devices on the same iCloud, so now I'm talking to myself here. It doesn't even give you an option to decline, it's auto-accepting. So here we can see that it's going straight to DCIM, or I was sharing a text file with myself that's saying, what do you want to do with this? In this scenario here, what I did was I sent myself a text file, and it was a link in that text file. I saved it to my notes, and then I opened it in Safari. Now, are the artifacts going to speak to you that way? No. I know this happened because I sent it to myself. Um, again, no option to decline. So now we're going to look at what this actually looks like in the artifacts. So I will caution you here, and that line looks very weird, <laughs> but I will caution you, I knew something occurred. So at this point, you knew from other evidence, maybe you had Sarah's Mac. You're like, I know she airdropped Heather something, or I know Heather received an airdrop file because someone was looking over her shoulder and saw it. So you know airdrop occurred. What you could do is the very first thing you can do in that backup is you could go to the push store and see if airdrop is even enabled. Does the user have this enabled, yes or no? Um, you can look at the data usage SQLite file, which I have in a slide coming up, and say, okay, are there artifacts showing airdrop at all? So at this point, you know the airdrop was used. So what you can attempt to do is timeline, but I wish you the best of luck because things don't always fall into order as you would expect. Um, Sarah was seeing one way, I was seeing another, so we were confused, and then I was able to replicate what she was seeing mm -hmm. two out of three times. So what we have found is when an airdrop picture or video came in, it didn't necessarily fall in the correct order on where it should be in that DCIM. It made no sense, sometimes it did, Sometimes it didn't. And it was the same, I did PNG files several times. One time it worked, one time it didn't. So be careful with timelining on this. Um, other places you can look. Exif data, no. We were hoping it would say that it was sent from or taken with Sarah's iPhone or captured with Sarah's Mac and then shared. Didn't get anything there. Um, pure desperation at this point because you know someone told you Sarah sent a text file to Heather through AirDrop. What you could then do is you would find it in my notes. So if you were looking at all the databases on my device, you would see it was in notes. You can see that I show it in Safari on the far right. Um, you can open it in third-party apps. So at this point, you're literally on a wild goose chase. And do you have time for it? Your saving grace is this data usage.sqlite file. Here you're actually going to see sharing D. So you could do a search for sharing D. Sarah already mentioned this. And we can also see airdrop. So you could do a search for airdrop but that's really all you're getting. 
You will see some of the bonjour activity as well, but you're not getting the file that was shared, the date timestamps, all the good stuff that Sarah showed you not going to exist on these backup files from what we've been able to find so far. If you get crafty and you then go for live analysis and start doing dynamic analysis, you will get log files. So here, I connected my iPhone to iBackupBot, which is free, and I started doing dynamic analysis and just copying out the log files. You will see I get some of what Sarah got, but not even close with all the artifacts. So we can see that my Bluetooth LE scanning started. Um, you can see that the mode was everyone. So I wanted to connect with everyone. You can see scanning started um, successfully. And what you will see is that it will start scanning and it will drop off if it doesn't find anyone in that point of time. Um, continuing on, you can see that airdrop has been initiate, initiated and it found me. Sarah mentioned the GUIDs and the unique IDs for airdrop. You can see my airdrop ID there for my Mac. And then new airdrop connection. So a connection was established. We could see the handshake and the negotiation going on. We could see the request and then it's parsing, it's received, but it doesn't tell you what is received. So you just know that something was received and something is trying to be shared. So now you're still guessing. Um, what you can get from this though is the settings on my device. So if you look down at the bottom here where it says notify from face up portrait, that's how my device is set. That if my phone is face up, I'm gonna get a portrait saying Sarah wants to airdrop this file to you. Um, if you look at the alert item, you can actually go into my log file and it will tell you what kind of tone plays or how I'm alerted, does it stay in my notifications, is it persistent or not. So you can dive through and keep digging into these artifacts. The final thing that you do get, you see accepting transfer and you see this GUID up here. What I recommend is exactly what Sarah said. Take that GUID and search all your plists, all your databases, anything you have on the iPhone to see if you can associate it to any way one of our devices. Um, it doesn't give you information that even a movie was sent versus a picture. You don't get to see it. So you don't know that this actual picture was sent. The reason I have it there is because I know I sent it. And then you'll see the server connection drops off. So it's better than a backup file, but chances of you actually getting the iPhone and doing live analysis while an airdrop is occurring is probably slim to none, mm -hmm. especially if you're doing forensic analysis and isolating from the network, this shouldn't be occurring. But this is the major difference on limitations with iOS on what you will not get at this point. With handoff, and I'll hand that to you while I talk to you. You'll hand it off. I'll hand that off to you. So that ends airdrop. Now we're gonna talk about handoff. So what does it look like when you start an action on a Mac and continue on a phone or add in your watch? So handoff allows us to be lazy. The lazier we get, sometimes the better the evidence is. Sometimes it makes it harder to ascertain where something occurred. So we are going to try to do that as well. But handoff allows you to copy something from your iPhone, continue on your Mac, and continue through. Some prerequisites here. Bluetooth and Wi-Fi must be enabled. You must be on the same network. So you have to be on the same Wi-Fi network. Um, you have to have the same iCloud account. So it's not that Sarah can continue onto my devices. It would be all hers or all mine and handoff must be enabled. You'll see in the slides here, we show you how to enable it on your phone, how to enable it on your actual Mac. And you'll see on the screenshots here, the little icons are showing you that continuity and handoff is actually enabled and this is where it's going to continue and where you can pick up where you left off. So as an example from going back to those Mac logs, again, those Mac logs are gonna be your key evidence uh, from this case. Uh, so we go again, sharing D. We're looking for com Apple sharing instead of airdrop like we saw before. We're gonna look for handoff specifically. And again, we have those different GUIDs that are bolded in there to show different transactions. So I might be interested in this particular transaction. I'm gonna do a search for that one string that starts 476ED and kind of look through that whole list of different um, uh, log events. And again, it could be hundreds, it could be thousands of different events. Um, so below that, we have sharing the received new advertisement. All right, so it sees that I have a device unique ID, this F9B. There's that uh, UU, uh, GUID again that I want to look across all my devices, perhaps look in my uh, Bluetooth P list to try to match it up to a specific device. In this case, it's very nice because it actually shows me which device it's associated with. Sometimes you get that, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you have to search within context. So if I keep going down into that one log entry, 
I'll see the device name is my phone 7, and the make and model, which is the iPhone 9,3, which in human terms is the iPhone 7. So we'll see a lot of those uh, items going back and forth, which can be very helpful to tie to specific devices. Now again, we're gonna look for that F9B, that is my, my, I, my, my phone 7 uh, unique identifier. You're not just gonna wanna search and filter on those handoff or the sharing B stuff. You're gonna wanna look within context as well. Because I'm showing you another one here. It says doc uh, user activity, com Apple user activity main. And this is gonna show you certain information associated. So this is that little icon that pops up if I'm working on a text document or an email. and says, hey, would you like to hand this off? That shows up on the doc itself. Now this one I highlighted specifically because it says user activity has web page URL. So sometimes you get hints of what type of data is being pushed back and forth to devices. And I show you another one here with the bird or the cloud docs daemon. A lot of the stuff happens over iCloud as well. So you don't want to filter out of everything. You want to look within context. And again, you're going to be looking at thousands of different messages here. There's, there's a lot of things to look at. Uh, so just, you know, don't get frustrated and just kind of get used to seeing some of these things. I was actually worried that these logs wouldn't be very verbose. <laughs> Unfortunately, they're more verbose than you even want them to be. But I say more is better than nothing, so I'm willing to take it. With an example here, so a little scenario. What you're actually looking at, and you have to look up top, the iPhone to the Mac. So on this specific scenario, Safari was opened and browsing on the iPhone. So the screenshot on the far right is the iPhone. When going to the Mac, the Mac was set that Chrome is the default browser, not Safari. So the Mac is smart enough to know that the user wants to access what they are doing on their iPhone in Safari in Chrome. So you will have artifacts in both here. So what you see on the iPhone browsing in Safari, when continuing on the Mac, do you see the little iPhone by Chrome? When you click on that, it continues exactly where you left off. So what does that look like? If I actually click that link on my Mac in Chrome, what does that look like? So user activity D, it's gonna say queuing fetch for best app UUID. It's basically looking for the best app associated with that particular data. In this case, it's gonna be my Chrome browser. Uh, I got a few other things like fetching payload, requesting payload, request to that specific UUID again associated with a specific device, and finally requesting handoff payload, and so on and so forth. So the next one we're gonna see is that sharing D item again. But we have a different um, um, item here, Com Apple Transport IDS connection. So it's using this identity services stuff to show the different interaction between the devices. And you can also do searches for the continuity, Com Apple Private Alloy Continuity. You'll see that in these logs every once in a while. So you get certain hints on this type of activity. You also see this identity services, connect a continuity connect to peer. So I can tie that one GUID to a specific device, and if I look within context, I see some Google Chrome activity happening here. Com Apple CF pasteboard entry, we'll talk about that one a little bit further on, but that's basically saying, I got this URL in my pasteboard, and I wanna provide it to you. And I have that in the UTF plain text. So you get an idea of what type of data storage um, it's holding off here. And finally, received requested handoff payload from my phone seven, and you can see that it's been shared uh, to my Mac itself. Um, so kind of figuring out where application was being used. You have to look within context. So these are all separate events on here. I just wanna point that out. So if I'm sharing a notes, look for the notes application, reminders, mail, maps, numbers. All of this can be handed off. There's many different applications. So you always have to look within context of that handoff uh, log activity and try to figure out which application was actually being handed off to. I usually just do a search for that copy data, and that seems to be a good standard key term to look for in this case. So from the Mac to the phone, if I'm in the Maps application, um, on the Mac itself, on my laptop, and I wanna send a certain location to my phone, maybe I'm gonna go drive there or something, I can see that I have the Maps Core Spotlight going on there, the bundle ID, Com Apple Maps, the sharing D handoff um, log activity is there as well. You see it's connecting to my iPhone 7, it's received items, so instead of sent, it's receiving. 
And then finally, you get the model identification, the name, and the IDs associated with that as well. So you can correlate this stuff back and forth pretty easily uh, using the MAC logs. Now, we also have ready to respond handoffs. So these things are extremely verbose. It almost seems redundant at times. So responding ready to handoff, received payload request, and then finally you get the, uh, the bird, the cloud docs information, the iCloud information. And then finally we have requesting handoff encryption key from my phone. So we saw it sets up SSL, it sets up encryption keys. So honestly, from the network standpoint, we've not looked at that yet. We told you we are going to look at it eventually. It's gonna be really interesting to see if we can see anything because of that encryption on there. Now we have a few other tiny sections here for you just to summarize other things that we've seen. So Apple Pet, on my Mac in Safari, I browsed out to this Etsy site, which Eric, if you're sitting in here, this is what those bows are. Um, I went to an Etsy site and looked for Tiny Vibes Boutique. From there, I had the option to use Apple Pay. So I used the Touch ID on my phone, and it saved to the Mac and also on the phone. So this is where the artifacts could get tricky. The good news is with Safari, you'll see um, under the history database file, you can see the origin column and say, did it happen on this device or is it associated from another device on that same iCloud? So you could then say, okay, it's something else that Heather was on that's logged into her same iCloud. And if you go back to the very beginning where Sarah showed all my devices that my iPhone recognized, it would be one of those. Um, also, the recents. I recovered the actual transaction where I got the transaction receipt sent to my email. I was able to go, I deleted it because I delete everything as quickly as it comes in, even when I'm creating evidence. And I was able to go in and actually carve it out of the hex and recover this information. But again, this is really what you got with the Apple Pay artifacts. So you can see that I go out to Etsy, that I purchase a bow, that I paid for it with Apple Pay, I got the transaction receipt, and then you see the picture of my daughter with the bow on her head. So one more, uh, we got auto unlock. This one I was thrilled to be able to, to use. So auto unlock is the activity where I can open up my Mac with my watch. So there's certain requirements for that. I had to be on the same iCloud account, I have to have two-factor authentication, uh, Bluetooth and network have to be enabled, all sorts of stuff. Uh, all the moons have to align for this all to work. Uh, but it does actually work out quite well. So this just saves me put in inputting the password in because it's authenticating through my watch. Very useful. So what does it look like? So, <laughs> that's not gonna happen, Deb, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we got a few more slides here left to go. So auto unlock. Again, we have these Apple Unified logs. We have different lock states. So we'll see the lock states just in general logging terms. It doesn't necessarily associate to auto unlock. So I'm specifically gonna look for that auto unlock uh, activity in those log entries uh, and look for the different log states in here. Uh, there's also other things that we can look for, the Bluetooth, the wireless uh, uh, proximity, nearby agent, sharing handoff. Handoff gets used as a subset for a lot of other uh, Apple continuity activity as well. So actually unlocking, you can see the begin unlock in there. You can see the device information, the make and model, the Apple ID um, association with that, and a few other devices in there. So the sharing D, auto unlock scanning for Bluetooth IDS, that's my phone and my watch. So it's got a proxy device, meaning my phone, as well as the ID for the uh, watch itself in there. Uh, once the unlock actually happened, you can verify that with uh, these couple of items. It'll show you which user account. My user account name is Oompa. Yeah, a bad nickname that I got many years ago. I think it's because I'm short. Uh, a couple of different Bluetooth IDs. Again, the watch identifier information, whether unlock was enabled and whether it was locked on my wrist. So if I had not put the pin code on my phone or on my watch here, it's not gonna unlock. So it is a locked device. Then finally, if I keep going down here, I'm gonna see some Bluetooth IDs and ranging information. It's basically saying, is this watch within proximity of this laptop? Um, and different key bag states and lock states associated with that. One note on this Mac, uh, Mac address here. Uh, Apple uses Mac randomization for a lot of the Bluetooth and wireless information. So you might see these Mac addresses in here and try to pair it up with a certain device. You're not gonna have a whole lot of luck with that because of the randomization. Uh, so just a caveat there. You see it, you want to associate it with something, but Apple is not going to let you from a privacy standpoint. So you gotta look in different areas of the logs themselves. A couple caveats. 
If you do um, open up, unlock your, uh, unlock your Mac devices with the watch itself, it doesn't look the same as other unlocks in the log. Sometimes it doesn't get recorded at all. So I'm still doing some research on that to kind of figure out why it's not being recorded, because uh, from a forensic standpoint, that's gonna be really important information. So it, in different logs, it looks slightly different. All right, I'll go through clipboard quickly. You do get these slides. So clipboard here, we're on the Mac, copying from notes, pasting it into the iPhone, and sending an email. So we're just going to take a quick look at what this looks like. So when we look at the log files on the Mac, what you're actually going to see is the copy-paste, so the app that's being used. Um, we can see the payload request, that unique identifier that Sarah had mentioned earlier. We see it's associated to the iPhone. Um, and we see that this was a text file. If you look at the flavor at the bottom, that's what you're seeing there. Um, continuing on, we sent two more flavors here. So flavor one was a JPEG, and then flavor two is actually going to be a movie file. So as you go through here, you're going to see the payload request and all the sharing information, as well as that it was remote. The device is not the same one, so a remote device was reaching out. Um, here you can actually see where the iPhone was sending the movie to the Mac. That icon at the beginning, or at the end there, is what it looks like on the Mac when the movie is coming in. So you can see from the log files all of this remote access actually happening with the continuity. And finally, one last topic for you is instant hotspot. So I have my phone that I can tether to. So when I have crappy hotel internet, which I'm sure we've never come across before ever, um, I can tether my phone to it so I can actually get some decent signal. Uh, so it uses that same continuity features on there. Again, Bluetooth and wireless need to be up and running. And I can just select it up in my wireless settings. Instead of airdrop or handoff, I'm gonna look for sharing.tethering uh, in this case. So you can see it's starting to browse, scanning for available tethering devices gonna find my phone in there with that F7, discovered new device, you see the Wi-Fi agent in there, my phone seven and all the other identifiers, but also the battery life, what type of network it's on, and the signal strength. So that signal strength two, meaning it's got two dots filled in um, on my iPhone versus the normal five if you have good signal. A few other things, enabling hotspot. So you can see if it was just searched for if, or, if, or if it was actually enabled, whether credentials were passed back and forth, uh, the different channel uh, information on there, and finally that it's enabled and the information associated with that at the very end. All right, so these are our final two slides, Rob, we promise. Our caveats here. Um, Mac artifacts are more fruitful, and we do mean that, we do, with CIDR, with the pun and everything yeah. here. Um, we literally scratched the surface here, so we have a ton more digging to do. Um, we intend to keep presenting this at further events. So what we're going to do is we're going to throw in Phil's network perspective with this. Um, Sarah and I are going to keep digging. We want to focus a little bit more on iOS and also throw in jailbroken devices and see what it actually looks like so you know what you can get if you have a forensic image versus trying to do dynamic analysis on these devices. Um, just be aware that the timestamps are tricky. Do not rely on them when it comes to iOS. Um, make sure you are digging through these logs. You will get buried in them very, very quickly. It's a lot of data. It's exhausting. It is exhausting. So again, if you want to see more about how we kind of evolve this presentation, we're gonna give it at a few different other locations. Uh, if you're interested in just general mobile or Mac forensics, come to our classes. We got a few of them going on here. Uh, we're both here for the whole week in Austin, which is gonna be awesome. Uh, but we do travel to other places as well. You could so. still transfer out of your other classes and come to ours this week. <laughs> <laughs> if you've changed your mind, we'd be happy to have you. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Slides will be available later on.